why this poem and this poem. So sorry I left you behind. Once we sat on the same bench, ate from the same bowl, and drank from the same cup. Inseparable we seemed, dreams intertwined and plans overlapped. It seemed we were headed in the same direction. We would drown in pettiness and dream to the limits of what our eyes could see. An ego has seized the soar, a gem had lost its sparkle. And so I journeyed through myself and back to where we sat, and I realized that we, we weren't headed in, on, we weren't on the same frequency, that we weren't headed in the same direction. So I decided to walk my own path and soar in pursuit of my destiny and purpose. So sorry I left you behind. Sorry I parted ways with the dreams we once shared in that barrel, cluttered with hopelessness, frustration, and shattered hopes to a bigger vision and calling. Sorry I broke free from the lies and narrowness of the world we knew in search of a bigger world out there, one in which I truly dedicated, unable to be boxed in or labeled. Sorry you felt we were headed in the same direction when all I saw was a transit point. Sorry I lost you, but oh, I'm not really sorry because in losing you, I found me. Sorry I left you behind. <laughs> this one is very emotional. It's called the Ebola Ride. The next one, if you all can recall, in 2014, a few years ago, Liberia was hit by the deadly Ebola virus, and we were in the middle of it. And it was that's when I met you. It was a terrible experience, and it felt like you were on this ride that was headed to no particular place. We didn't know where Ebola came from. We didn't create it but we had to deal with it and find a cure for it or find a way to contain it. So during that, that period, I was inspired to write this poem called Ebola Ride. So it basically captures the emotions that we all went through and the experience. So if you weren't there, you'd get a taste of how it felt. On the Ebola Ride, paranoia is the driver. It takes you on a high and leaves your senses hanging in the wild. Fear is its deputy and panic the conductor. You never know which way the bus will go, but you are told that as long as you stay put, wash your hands, and limit human contact, you are in a safe, you are safe, at least for a while. You do your best to secure your seat, making sure your loved ones are safely on board. But as death news come in, you are reminded that this isn't a normal ride. You get a sudden kick, a silent voice asking why you're still here, perhaps on a mission or for a purpose, then suddenly gratitude takes over as you give thanks for still being alive. And this is all happening on the Ebola ride. Still on the road, pickups rush by with men dressed like aliens, either carrying or going to pick up fallen victims. Somewhere in a containment unit, a baby cries in horror as his mother takes her last breath. You peek through the window. Crowded streets create the illusion of a normal life. But as alive as everything appears on the outside, fear is slowly, slowly killing us on the inside. Fear is killing us slowly on the inside. Sometimes we wonder who will get up next. But as they all arrived, no traffic lights, no horns, no road signs, just us against an unseen enemy. The night brings relative calm, but we rarely sleep as the nightmare of what's to come the day ahead haunts our dreams. And on the other side, the ocean wind sets the flames in a crematorium ablaze as our hearts leap for the souls of the ones dearly loved. No last goodbyes, only memories, anguish, pain, and grief. We are stuck on this bumpy ride with tiny doses of hope. And though help arrives, we are still in doubt as they too are clueless about when the ride will end. So world, we are here on this hand washing, temperature taking, emotion breaking, friends avoiding, hugs and handshake prohibiting, non-stop Ebola ride. So that's 
that was the Ebola experience in a nutshell. For me, um, the Ebola time was, um, I, I was very, the, the silent, it took so long for the world to react to it. So Facebook has started a case that we should match up to the World Health Office here, um, H, WHO office, to demand action because like they were so silent. And for me, I was, one thing that really touched my heart, the helplessness of people. You know that there was a guy, a very healthy uh, man, and he was struck by the disease. And nobody could do anything. They just watched and a couple of days later, they just came to announce that this healthy individual had just passed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the helplessness of human being, humanity at that time was like, that was the most, you know, we can do nothing about, nothing this, about this stuff. It was a difficult time. Wow. So how was it like for you people? How, I mean, the trauma that you guys might have gone through, you never knew who was going to die next. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a confusing time because it came out of nowhere and it was so sudden and we had to deal with it and it taught us a lot. It taught us a lot about volunteering, about you know communities coming together locally at a local level, holding their resources instead of waiting for international people to come because the interventions that took place during the Ebola outbreak were in, at the community level, people you know using their buckets to put chlorine in it, educating their kids on how to wash their hands, um, people stopping, you know, handshakes and hugs. Those were all efforts that were done at the community level. And they ended up being, you know, going widespread. And that's how we're able to combat the disease and also with the help of international organizations. But I saw a time of volunteerism where, you know, people came together to just work together without seeking pay which is not a thing in, in Liberia. You know, everybody Africa. wants that little thing or Africa, yes. So that was that was a, a tough time and we learned a lot. We you learned a lot from it. Friend, yes, a former Miss Liberia because I was a Miss Liberia. She died. She died. And when she mm. died, what happened for me was really chaotic because I had gone to a fellowship in the US and all of the strategies and insights we gained at a fellowship we were all fired up waiting to go back to Liberia to implement those ideas. And we just fell right in the middle of the Ebola outbreak. You know, and, and it crippled us because we couldn't do all of our projects. We had to stay at home and it was really tough. But when this girl died, it hit close to home for me because, I mean, it's not like Miss Liberia's our target. You know, Ebola doesn't discriminate like with any other disease. But people kept saying, they thought I was the one who had died. And this girl, the sad thing about it is that it wiped away her entire family. Everybody died, her mother, the sisters, all of them, they died. And I stayed there for a few months and tried to do my part to keep the young people, teaching them, reading to them. And I, at a time, I just got so depressed and I left for a few months, you know, to get my thoughts together, get my hair right again. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to say something. Um, little Liberian, like I like to call it, has been through so much and was almost forgotten. And but it's yet it's so unforgettable. Um, Liberia went through so many years of civil war and unrest, and it's almost like when the people were ready to breathe a sigh of relief. Yes, Ebola came, and someone told me when I went to Liberia that. Ebola was worse than the war because it was like a thief, you know, an unwanted visitor that visited you whether you were prepared for it or not. And it, I can just imagine the fear it went through. People couldn't touch each other, you know. And But I just want to say that I think Liberians are very, very strong people because I don't think... Liberia has been through so much. Liberians are very strong people, and Liberians have such a voice. And seeing such a beautiful woman here stand up and use her voice so positively is really beautiful. I'm happy to be here. Thank oh, you. thank you so much, Irene. We're all so proud of you. I actually have a question to do with the, uh, the Avoda Bike book, which is, um, thank you. Which is, did you write it um, at the time yeah. that the outbreak was happening? And, yeah. 
why did you write it? Like, why did you feel that writing was your way to express yourself at, at that time? It's always been a tool for me from, from the war. Like I said, I was really young when the war started. So most of the things that happened during that period, I would always document them. It was a way of healing. It was, I couldn't explain. <laughs> you know, my friends kept calling me from the US. What is this thing called Ebola? What is it about? What was it? And once I started to really understand what was happening, I decided to write this poem. It just came out of nowhere. I wasn't trying to be politically correct. I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I just sat one day and I was about to travel. I think it was when this guy died, Thomas Eric Duncan. The first person that died from Ebola, the Liberian guy, he went to the US and he died there. I was hit so strongly by that. And I cried for days. <laughs> My sisters, they always say I cry for every little thing, but it was really sad. It was almost like it was related to me. Um, and I wrote this poem to, to, to add a human side to the experience. Because at the time, on the news wires, you would only see bodies. They were giving it a different representation, you know. So I decided to write this to to say, yes, I'm living through it, and this is what's happening, instead of what you guys, the way you guys are sensationalizing it. Um, it was even carried on PBS News Hour in the US. Um, several other outlets carried it, and people were really, they were deeply touched by it, and a lot of Liberians said that it really um, resonated with them, and it mirrored exactly the way it felt at the time. So it accomplished its purpose. <laughs> All right. Um, adding up to what our sister was saying, um, first and foremost, I like the voice, I like the reading performance, but I was very touched when you were reading a poem about the war, because I personally have witnessed a war, and that was around 1992. I was very young, but I could still remember, in Ivory Coast, that was between Asante Kotoko and Asep Mimosa. Yeah. And in fact, I was very young at that age, but I saw people killing people, not guns. People killing people. So when you were reading, it just gave me a flashback of what. So I felt like, no, let me also do a very short piece of what, you know, we have the First World War, Second World War. Sometimes I ask myself, what brought up all this war, you know? So I was reading a book, and then I think the First World War started from Poland. And Poland has a capital, which is a Warsaw. So I'm like, how can the war start from Warsaw? <laughs> so, all right, so this is just a phrase, an extract of my piece. I saw a war in Warsaw. This war I saw was an ISO. Mm. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. <laughs> well, you really well, captured us there. <laughs> I've been going to Poland for some time. Last year, I was I've there been there. It's nice. My show, my, uh, yeah, so last year, was the Ghana week. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. They call it yeah. 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 But still, that's creative. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was that was nice. <laughs> the next one is called my black bra and I. It's on page twenty-five. Your what? Black my black bra and I. Most women have this one undie, or most humans, <laughs> that they like a lot. <laughs> and with time, it becomes like your friend. Mm -hmm. For some, especially women, it's the black bra. It could be that one bra. It could be a pink bra for some. It could be a purple bra. But for most women, it's a black bra. And so this person in this poem has a love and fear for their black bra, and so we're going to <laughs> It says, people will never understand what we have, but my black bra and I have a love and fear. She holds me tight when his hands are nowhere in sight. With defiance, she gives me confidence, holding the twins firm when his five kids send them falling from perky land to sagging land. She keeps them standing tall and reassures me, saying, you still got it, girl. Keep your head up. Yes, we do talk, and a special bond we share cannot be concealed. My black bra and I surely have something deep going on. Permanently dressed in black, she moans daily for all the hurt he caused and clings to me gently, caressing away the pain. 
She's my girl, and our intimacy is shared bliss. She knows and sees everything, secrets and all. She hides all my scars and is first to smell every fragrance. Her clip on my back, a reminder that she's got me. Her protective grip feels like his hands, except this time it's gentle and I'm no longer that vulnerable girl. So I relish in her ever embrace. We cannot kiss or look into each other's eyes, but what we share is also dear. I feel safe and not betrayed, loved and not hurt. I feel liberated every time she touches and clings onto me. Oh, did I mention she saves me from going under the knife? Yes, we know how to package the girls, and that's our well-kept secret. My black pride and I have an unbreakable love affair to last through the ages. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> Let's see how many I've read. You said five. Yeah, the first yeah, I, I, okay, question. Yeah, um, how did you select the poems in this collection? Because they're very diverse, obviously, even from what you've just read. Okay. I, it's a journey. As I said, it's a journey of dreamers, of overcomers, of people who have been through a lot, who have been broken, but have managed to wake up, to rise up. Um, it somewhat mirrors Liberia's story but through personal experiences, you know, people who, and it also has a lot to do with women, how we are able to find that inner strength, you know, to rise up. I feel like we deal with so much, you know, so it's a journey of becoming your own, you know, coming into your own, um, cherishing simple things and adding, me giving meaning to them, and um, digging be beyond what seems ordinary. You know, a black bra, somebody will just look at it and say it's just a black bra. But everything has something, has a role to play. And there's a story, like I said, you can tell your story to everything. So it's my journey. It's the journey of Liberia. It's the journey of women. It's the journey of anybody who wants to be more and do more. Did you write them all at one time? Or is it over a number of years? Like over a number, number of together? years. Over a number, number of years. years, yeah. So some of them are from my high school years. And you would see the maturity in the writing as I get older. So the poems that I wrote when I was in high school, the voice is different. Even if when I write the love poems, you see the fantasy in there. But as I get older, you see my realistic point of view when it comes to love and relationships and, and things that happen to women, real life issues, other than just daydreaming and fantasizing. So. It's my journey in so many ways, but it's your journey, it's her journey, yeah. it's all of our journeys. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, what, what I find quite interesting about them is that they're quite personal, but they're also quite universal as well. So, yeah. Thank you. That was the whole idea, so that it relates, so everybody can relate. There was a lady in Hong Kong, she bought the book and she, and she even sent me a note, she was crying, she said she had, you know, self-esteem issues about her breasts, you know, and all of that. And her, her bra, she, the poem helps her realize that her bra has really helped her over the years <laughs> to, to regain her confidence. And when she read this poem, she said it helped her heal, you know, to appreciate who she is and other things that help her enhance what she naturally has, like yep. her, her bra. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what can one do to break this bond between you and your bra? It's not me. Like I said, I said it's a lady, not me. <laughs> but it could be me, it could not be. Between that lady and her bra. You cannot break the bond between a lady and her bra. Or it's it's simply saying that a woman has to have her own safe space. Okay? A woman has to have a place that she goes to that is sacred and unique for her. She cannot get lost in you as a man. She needs that escape from the relationship, from being super mom, from being super woman, from being every woman, to just going to her little place that she can find solace. You know, I, I believe that we all should have our little sanctuaries that we go to when we are broken. Because if you want to break that relationship with a woman or a bride, she comes to you. Will you be able to <laughs> do what the black, the black bride is doing? Also, the, the, the black bride is a metaphor. So it, yes. can, it can be uh, a dependable man. Yeah. You have a man that you trust, like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you can, yeah. So. It can be your work, 
It can be like for Sylvia uh, Liberia, it can be that black bra. Uh, for Irene, her voice, her art, you know, her business, you know, can be that black bra. But you cannot take that away from someone because they lose who they are, the essence of, of, of who they are. My writing has been somewhat like a baby and a black bra to me. And if I ever were to have a partner who says don't write, it will not work. Or a friend who doesn't support it. You don't have to support it, but you have to appreciate it and respect it. You know, so it's just about people respecting each other and letting people be whatever they, whoever they want to be. Yeah. yeah, I like the images you just use. Talking of, I mean, poetry is very deep. <laughs> Yes. You know, to, to the ordinary mind, thinking of the main bra, yes. but you know, I like when you're using the expression as her business, her voice, you know, and among others. Yeah, that, that was very good. I like that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank L-I-B, the place to be. So the lake name for Liberia is L-I-B, you ready? Yes, I read it Oh, okay. <laughs> the lake name for Liberia is L-I-B. And so for some people, when you say Liberia, is so many different emotions. Um, but I say it's the place to be. It depends on what you're looking for when you go there. So I wrote this poem to inspire patriotism in Liberians in the diaspora around the world. So come home, you know, and let's do what we did before the war. Let's enjoy our country in spite of all the good, the bad, and the ugly. It says, they call it LIB. I call it the place to be. Nowhere else I would rather be, but right here in LIB. I know it's bumpy, sometimes even rocky. The hustle takes the pressure high, the often sigh, but if that's the definition of pain, I can endure it just to be in LIB. A land of beauty and resilience, budding cultures and vibrant spirits. Who can ever ignore a hospitable embrace? Oil palm and mangrove swamps, cool December hamatan wind, dust-filled nostrils and nearly pippin laden skin. For all the same, the beach is within my reach. Mangoes and sugar cane, brown pea and butter pear and cassava leaves, they're always in haste to savor the taste of L.I.B. Hepco, Bema, Pempe, yes, that's L.I.B. Years of war and intruder Ebola could not dim the light of Africa's lone star. Rushing waters and sunny skies, too different to ignore, too unique to copy. Streets littered with humor and wisdom from young and old. Sasa and drums resounding stories untold. I travel far and wide, but every new path takes me back to LIB. Normal days are back, so join me in LIB, the place to be. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Was it generated? Yeah.